Hello, hello. Thank you everyone for tuning in. My name is Zanda Shea Brown and I am the artist engagement and programming manager for the New Orleans Film Society. I'm a Louisiana born and raised filmmaker and I'm honored to be moderating this conversation, this panel for the 32nd New Orleans Film Festival called Lifting As We Climb, Building an Independent Filmmaking Community. And I'm joined by two incredible filmmakers, Felicia Pride and Mel Jones, who I'll soon have introduced themselves and share a bit more about um, how they've gotten to their paths. But we wanted to have this conversation mounted at the festival because one of uh, the biggest questions that I think emerging filmmakers ask after being given the advice of, you know, find your people is how. And uh, through their connection, through their work, I've seen them both forge paths for themselves and, and bring other people <laughs> through those paths, you know, with them. Uh, hence the title, Lifting As We Climb, which as a filmmaker is something um, that definitely other people around me have done for me in a, in a, in a tradition that I hope to continue in. Uh, and so I just wanted to talk about that a bit here today. Um, so I will briefly introduce Felicia Pride, a writer, a producer, and award-winning filmmaker. She has written on Queen Sugar, Grey's Anatomy. She's the writer and executive producer of Really Love, uh, which you know we all thirsted over Kofi <laughs> on recently for Netflix. Uh, and she runs the Create Daily. Um, which is a resource for underrepresented storytellers that was founded in 2012. We're also joined by Mel Jones, a film producer whose credits extend to films like Burning Sands, Dear White People, and Stella McGee's The Weeknd, as well as Really Love. And she's the founder and owner of Invisible Collective. And so I'm sure y'all can give me a much more thorough uh, explanation, but I'd love to hear how you know, what, what your journey was to where you are now. And I'll start with you, Felicia. Ooh, I, every time I think of my journey, I get tired. Uh, it was very, <laughs> it was very, uh, you know, um, circuitous, I guess that's how you say that circle. Um, you know, I started out as essentially a journalist almost 20 years ago. Um, and I was writing about music, I was writing about culture, I was writing about books, um, and then decided I wanted to go back to school and kind of professionalize that. Um, but my, I had my eye on books. So I went back to school to Emerson and got a degree in writing literature and publishing. Um, and it was actually there when I think about community that I started um, doing things in this way where I would organize events for, I think we were called the Hanas, you know, everybody who wasn't white. Um, <laughs> for the HANA organizations where I was bringing people together under about literature, essentially. Um, so it kind of started there. Uh, and then I, I worked, I moved to New York and worked in New York book publishing, eventually sort of carved out a niche for myself, writing about books um, and then wrote books and then found out, I didn't realize it then, but books wasn't really my form. I got burnt out, stopped writing for seven years. And in that time, I was basically what we call now an impact producer. Um, I leaned back on my marketing degree that I got an undergrad and was essentially helping social justice projects reach audiences. Um, and a lot of that is, you know, I would never call it community organizing in that way, at least what I was doing, but it's adjacent to the idea of gathering, the idea of community, the idea of reaching people where they are. Um, and so I did that for a long time. It was very gratifying work, but I had the call to be, you know, I love being in service of creatives, but I had the call to like get back to my creative voice and self. So six years ago, I moved to LA um, with a screenplay that eventually came, became Really Love, which me and Mel worked on together. It was directed by Angel Christy Williams. Um, and in that time, uh, you know, was, did not really know a lot of people in LA. Um, so we can talk about how, you know, started to build community, but um, I also just started to really position myself and see myself as a, as a creative again, as a writer and um, really got serious uh, started looking into and getting into TV writing. And then that took me to being staffed and selling shows and writing additional features. So that's the, the short and dirty of it. That's incredible. I'm tired for you just going through that. 
<laughs> going through that rundown. But uh, yeah, I mean, so many skill sets acquired. There's so much experience. That's quite a journey. And Mel, what has that path looked like for you? Um, I don't think mine is as exhausting as Felicia. It's pretty like straightforward. I feel like in comparison, like I, I, my mom's a teacher, my dad's a preacher. Stories were always a part of our lives, and um, also the power of those. So I knew I wanted to tell them, and I knew I didn't want to be a preacher. So I also started off um, in journalism, and very quickly moved um, to documentary film. And so I got a degree um, in film, uh, radio, television, and film at Howard, but it was with a concentration in documentary film. And I made my first one for uh, the um, PBS affiliate on campus. And I was just like, I'm gonna make documentaries. This, this is gonna be great. Um, and then I think I went, um, moved away, came back, started working for Discovery Channel and realized like how hard and long documentaries take and thought I don't have, my ADD doesn't support this lifestyle. Um, so I started looking at things where I could get more instant gratification um, and made, started making short films with friends and applied to AFI, um, and ended up at AFI and then as a producer and then, you know, kind of took it from there. So after graduating, it just so happened to be the recession um, and also the writer's strike right around that time. So there were no jobs and there was no money. And basically I had to um, figure it out through working as a temp at participant media. And that was my first job working as an assistant to Jonathan King, who was awesome. And another woman named Aaron Stam, who is also a producer. And um, when Aaron left the company, she left the business and I was her main assistant. So it left me without a job during the recession. And I ended up being a um, project involved film, film independence project involved, which was like a program that put you with mentors and gave you some money to make a film. So I made that uh, jump and I met Stephanie Lang. And so that's kind of how everything happened for me. She, we just took a liking to each other um, right away, which is not always the case when you get assigned to a mentor. Like most of the time they don't even know your name by the end of the mentorship. <laughs> and so that was the expectation, but we just really liked each other and really kind of warmed to each other. And so when she became the festival director, I became her assistant. And then I happened to bring her the script for Dear White People. I think she'd already gotten it to her inbox in a, a bunch of different ways and never looked at it. And she never looked at it when I gave it to her either. But after um, Justin Simeon made his, you know, like Indiegogo campaign, it was that video. She was like, we should be making things like this. And I was like, well, check your inbox, friend. And she did. And um, that started, I mean, then she trusted me, I think, in terms of just my creative ideas and our sensibilities were aligned. And so then she just started, I mean, thankfully just giving projects to me to run with. So that's where Burning Sands comes from. That's where Stella McGee's project came from. Really love all of those. She just kind of really, you know, empowered me to do it. And she used her name and her influence to get us indoors that I wouldn't, I wasn't at the time able to get into. Um, yeah, and then eventually I started after directing, well, after producing so many first time directors, became very apparent that I could also direct and that it was something I was passionate about. So I um, ended up creating with two lovely ladies, a, um, a digital series that um, went to Sundance called Lamert Park. And it just came out on BT Plus this year. And now I'm here and I started the company that I'm now um, with two partners. Uh, everybody probably knows Stephen Love Jr. Um, and also Justin Polk from the advertising space. And it's a um, commercial production um, company and creative studio. We also have television and film projects as well. So I now straddle the line between advertising and film and television in a really cool way. So very excited about all the different things. Yeah, that's incredible. Also shout out Stephanie Lane that she was one of our former Emerging Voices mentors and yeah, yeah it's fantastic. So intentional. Mm -hmm. Well, that's incredible. I mean, so this conversation, and y'all have started to get into it a little bit, but this conversation is centered on building communities. So um, I'm wondering how the two of you sort of found each other in that community, how you found your way to yourselves. Uh, I think you you were both involved in Project Involved, right? Or, or actually uh, in film independent programs. Was that it or was this an earlier thing? You do it, Felicia. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we were uh, both involved in film independent uh, programs. I was in a screenwriting lab. And like Mel said, she was in Project Evolve. We met through Angel Christy Williams, who's the director of Really Love. 
um, who also went through Project Involved. Um, so shout out to Film Independent. Um, and uh, that, yeah, that's how we met him originally was through, was through Angel. Yeah. I was supposed to meet uh, Felicia at a party that I had planned and showed up like hours late to. But, but as I met Angel, well, to speak about community, um, you know, it was a party thrown by someone who worked at Film Independent at the time, Kelly Thomas, who I was new to LA. She invited me. Um, and that's actually where I met Angel was at this party that Mel also co through. But I, I, I think you, I saw you there eventually, but um, mm -hmm. we didn't really get to talk. But luckily, Angel and I got to talk, and that's where we learned that she wanted to direct romantic dramas. I had a romantic drama and that's sort of the spark and the origins of how Really Love as a project for the three of us came together. Wow, that's awesome. And what was it that sort of uh, hit it off in terms of like, you know, the two of you being able to collaborate together? Like what was the, what was the marker for that? Well, I would say like, you know, um, I had up until that point produced everything that Angel had ever directed. So when she had met Felicia, she was like, oh my God, I found my script. Like, this is going to be my first feature. Oh, you got to direct, you have to produce it. So I was like, okay, okay, let me read it. And so um, I actually went to Howard and lived in DC and like really um, connected to the material in a real way um, and, and wanted to be a part of it in that way. And so it just naturally, we naturally met that way through me reading the script and being like, yeah, this is, this is going to be, um, something special. I want to be a part of it. And then obviously meeting Felicia and everybody was cool with that. And so then I became the first kind of addition to their like two person team. And also just because films take so, so long <laughs> to make over the course of the time, over the course of time, Mel being the type of producer that she is, where she's like, not just a producer, you know, she's like psychologist, she's <laughs> dad, she's cheerleader. She's like all these things that we were able to really even get closer um, just as people, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's one thing to be collaborators, but then it's also another to like connect as people, um, as women in this business, as black women in this business, um, and to have a common language and have a shorthand already um, to, to get, get through things. I think that's one of the things when I think about community out here that has been so valuable to me is the, the sort of, I get it. <laughs> you know, I don't have to explain, they get it. And I have some, I have people who can, you know, talk me off the cliff, can, um, you know, hold me down, can ground me, can, you know, challenge me, all these things. And um, I think that over time, Mel and I really were able to like establish a, a real, a real like bond like, and friendship. Yeah. 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 Um, which is, I think I would say somebody asked me, I mean, I don't know if this is like the season for panels for me right now, but I've been on one like every day. <laughs> And like someone asked me, um, how do you choose your project? And it's shifted over time. Like I used to choose my projects because I really love the project, the actual idea, the script, the whatever. I now choose my project because I like the people um, because there's so many things that can go wrong with a project that's outside of anyone's control. It could, there could be a torrential downpour that destroys you know, your whole plan in the film never recovers from that. It can be money, it can be all types of things. And if that relationship between the people aren't right, if, if you can't get it straight with you all, then there's not already a built-in respect and rapport and a love and a, you know, just a, a want for everyone to win, it, it can get really shaky and it can become um, like an, an anticlimactic and an antithesis to what you were building, right? Because I guess I've become over time more process oriented and the process is the building of the community to make the thing and how the thing turns out is really kind of up to chance um, a lot of times. And so I think, you know, having that community and working within a community allows you to enjoy yourself no matter what kind of the end result is. And I think it helps with trust. And I think when you're in the creative process, trust is really important and that you understand that people have your, have your, um, what is the have your have best intentions for you? I think that's also really important. So as you're building community, you're also building trust, which I think goes a long way in the collaborative process. 
Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, building genuine, genuine relationships with people and connections feels like it's always a thing to save you in the end. Uh, and I think that, you know, mostly when we talk about networking, uh, or the ways that a lot of filmmakers are advised to network or not to network is to collect people uh, because that's a much different thing from actually investing in them. And, uh, you know, part of the inspiration for this conversation was just me thinking back and in, in some of the people who have been mentors to me personally. Um, and so many of them were black women. And I think that it has something to do about the, uh, you know, the lack of resources or like, um, or bridges into the gatekeeping around the process of filmmaking, around the resources that go into filmmaking. And so it's, it's just been an incredible thing to witness black women who have forged their own paths or who have, you know, who've had some help with other people opening the doors to see them doing that very same work and, and bringing people into their extended community. Um, but another thing that I also really appreciate is the, sh the sharing of resources, which, you know, is something that I noticed through things like the Create Daily, which is this incredible newsletter that if you are not subscribed to, you should absolutely be subscribed to. If you're looking for job listings, if you're looking for grants, if you're looking for, you know, anything, it's just... Um, sometimes you just don't know what is, what's available, you know, and so um, it's an incredible resource out there to see just what's available in the world. I also uh, remember when you were fundraising for Tender, you hosted um, a number of Zoom webinars. Uh, would you call them that, Felicia? Just, you know, private rooms on different things. Like, um, I believe one was on, I believe one was on festivals or? Um, I had one on pitching. Uh, on pitching, and, yes. Uh, just like, sort of the path to professional TV film writer. And one was on like developing a, a writing practice. Right, right. Which, you know, are two of the most common things that people are <laughs> always trying to learn about. And so like, this was a, a, a part of the crowdfunding strategy, which was brilliant. And then um, you also have the series that you've been running that the two of you did together actually uh, chats with my creative friends on Instagram, mm -hmm. which is so useful. And so I'd, I'd love to just hear more about uh, this decision to include resource sharing in the work that you do for your own projects and just, and, you know, just the generosity of it. Like why, why that's something that's important. It's so funny because I didn't realize, Mel, that your mother was a teacher. My mother was a teacher as well. Um, and so I feel like that's also instilled in me. And I actually did teach on the college level for several years and I got burnt out. I was like, I was looking at them students crazy. I was like, okay, I have to go. Um, but the, the idea of information sharing never left um, and wanting to be of service in that way never left. And then also just from the impact reducing space, like that space is about transparency around um, what you're doing and your process and your results. So it's kind of merging those two roles. Um, and then I also just found people were asking about like the things that we were doing with tender fundraising and the things that we were doing with the tender rollout. Um, so we had our creative chats, which like you said, was part of our fundraising strategy. And then we sold those, we packaged those and sold those after our crowdfunding as a way to continue fundraising. And then we also produced this resource on Medium um, that is basically the blueprint for what, how we crowdfunded, produced and distributed tender um, so that people who are making a short film might get ideas, people, you know, just laying out our process. Um, and then we also like released our numbers. Like this is our, we did this campaign. This is what the numbers look like. This is what we learned sort of thing. Cause again, that's kind of like what you do in the impact space. So bringing that into this space I thought could be helpful. Um, and uh, then the creative chats was just out of like boredom <laughs> in quarantine and like wanting to connect with people and like, how can, how can we be in conversation together? Um, and then to have, friends like Mel just show up and be giving with their insight and knowledge and experience was amazing. Um, so yeah, I just think it's kind of like a part of me um, as like part of the work is service, you know, part of the creative process is service. Uh, so 
Yeah, I feel the same. I mean, I don't, I don't have any, I'm not as like, um, I would say personally industrious. Cause I think I put so much into the films that I just try. I mean, you should see my Instagram is a hot trashy mess. Um, but I think the reason why I created invisible is because I was starting to feel burnt out myself by producing indie films. Um, because they take a lot that you don't really get paid that much and they take so much work because there's le less manpower right so the producers ending up doing more jobs and so but the reason why I make indie films is because I think it's incredibly important for us to in introduce new filmmakers into the world into the space and um, people who are women people who are of color are are invisible to those who have the resources to do that oftentimes and so I felt like it was, again, like my community service, my duty to like, because I have the skills to do it, to do it. Um, but you can only do like one, one film at a time. You know what I mean? Like, at least I can only do one film at a time, the type of energy that I put into each one. So starting the production company, Invisible Collective is all about making sure that um, people who are underrepresented have access to the advertising space. Um, and the collective allows for us to service way more people um, then I would be able to doing one indie film at a time and for people to make more money. So like, you know, commercials, you make $10,000 a day easily. Um, and that allows someone who has a creative project, the opportunity to build that without feeling um, kind of held back by the scarcity mentality and just like needing to survive. Um, and so that's a lot of what I was seeing when I would produce folks is like, they'd have to leave or they didn't know if they would be able to make a project or not because they didn't know what they were gonna eat the next day. Um, so I think that's in my way, how I've like developed my give back strategy is like being able to help way more directors at a time and being able to have my tentacles in, in both advertising and film and helping people like figure out how to sustain themselves, um, making, doing the things that they actually love. So, you know, big projects at studios are great but they also are made by committee and um, sometimes those committees don't include us. And so sometimes those messages get watered down. And so indie films are really important um, because with the right protection and the right love, you can get something out that no one would ever see any other way. And so it's just, um, I think that's just something that I've been doing and will continue to do and hopefully, you know, be able to balance it a bit better now through the company. Yeah, and independent producers deserve a holiday or, you know, money. Um, <laughs> money would be better. <laughs> there was a report that came out recently uh, that talked about how unsustainable it was. And so it's just important to recognize when an independent producer comes on, uh, especially for first time directors that, you know, it's they're, they're putting just so much into it. Um, I was just gonna add, like, I just want to, to what Mel is talking about. Cause I also think it's important like in community helping each other get work and, and, and get money um, with the sustainability piece of it is really, really big. So kudos to you Mel, that's big. Thank you. Yeah, it's so it's like, it's so nice to make one film but can you make two and three and four and five and six, you know? And I think there's so many incredible talents that just don't have the support system in the community to be able to do that. So. It is super important. And I think it's really important for all of us to remember that about each other. Like it's great to have dinner and to break bread together, but like make money together because yeah. that's really, you know what I mean? Like that's the real way to improve your lives and to grow your community is like help each other out and give each other opportunities. And when you can't do, a, do something, you have to pass because you're busy, call your friend and make sure your friend gets that opportunity. Like that's, mm -hmm. that's part of it. Yeah, that's huge. That's huge. Thank you for saying that. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit about how extending resources, how like this, um, I don't know, teacher mentality, do you call it that? You know, this thing passed down, how that has led to uh, your communities expanding. It's interesting because I don't, it's like I'll, I don't realize it until like someone mentions it, but like, seems like on a regular basis someone mentions how some resource or something that they were a part of that I was a part of um helped them or um and so you see that there's like 
that there is because sometimes you feel like in a black hole I remember what they create daily I was like I'm I'm gonna shut this down I'm tired I felt mm -hmm. like I was in a black hole because it's a newsletter isn't like but then you then people email you like I got this from that or I got you know and you realize like oh like um there are real people on the other end of this work that you're doing um and even if you don't hear about it because that's not necessarily the intent like it is having an impact um so that's been kind of amazing like just random uh people reminding me of like how the service has has helped them um and that also is like okay that's why it's important to continue doing this because you just never know um you just never know but i think even more specifically like uh, I want to say last year sometime I put out a call on um, Twitter for journalists, Black journalists who wanted to transition into film and TV, like just doing a Zoom, talking about my experience and like 300 Black journalists signed up and like, that was amazing. It was like uh, um, half showed up, like 150 Black journalists showed up and it was really amazing and like the relationships that came out of that, that I still are I'm still able to nurture this day it was was pretty pretty amazing um and then also I just think about the building community across up down sideways diagonal um because you never know where a job can come from you never know where opportunity like Mel is saying someone might call you because they can't take something on or whatever the case is so like that part of it is always important to me too it's like just you just never know where opportunities and resources and help can come from What was the question again? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the question was about just how extending resources has broadened uh, your own community. Yeah, I mean, oh man, like I, I get the, like I've been um, a mentor to a number of people through different programs. And um, I've also had, I've been lucky enough to somehow attract really great interns who then become VPs of companies, wow. you know? So like I've seen, I have benefited from teaching them and like making that little guide for my interns. Like, look, this is how you answer phones. Like when you get a real job, like answering the phone is more important in the beginning than like what you know about film. So let's get this right. Let me show you how to do this. Like these little things matter, you know, th this is the language you have to use. These are the things. And then them, you know, remembering that and I'm um, feeling, appreciative and like you know then it's like oh I got this project and they're like yeah like yes we're gonna set this up you know stuff like that um it has directly impacted me like tremendously and I'm always reminded by something that Stephanie told me when I first started which was be kind that was the number one rule because the people that you meet on the way up are the people that you meet on the way down um and this you know I always say in my experience, it's cyclical. Like, you know, people are hot and then they're not, then they're hot again, and then they're not, and then they're hot again, and they're not. And I think it's really about um, what impact did you leave on the people that you came in contact with when you need to make a phone call and say, hey, can you look at this? Or can I get your advice? Um, and so I think, you know, it's, I mean, in terms of that kind of passing down, it, it's been a blessing to me as much as it's been, like you said, I get emails all the time, like, oh, you spoke on this panel and like, I really, you know, this, this, I, I followed your instructions and I got a job and I'm like, okay, you know what I mean? Or like on Instagram, people saying like, can you watch my short? And I'm like, all right, send it to me in the next five minutes and I'll watch it, you know? And then like, who knows what happens, you know? But like, I think it, it just, it all kind of adds up to good karma regardless. Um, and I think that's, and then also just being able to, when you share resources, it's both ways. So yeah. it, it's not, you know, as, as like generous as it is, it's, it becomes a it's, a, it's a cyclical thing. And so when you share resources and when you talk to people, you learn things, you have your own ideas, you think about things different because of that person's different perspective. So I think it's also like deeply enriching, not just for the person who's receiving, but for you who you even sometimes articulating something that you know, you're like, dang, like I, I never articulated that now that I know that's how I feel, I should think about these other four. I just said this out of my mouth and like, now I need to like actually align myself to the, the advice that I just gave. So I think it's as enriching for, for, the, for us as it is for those who 
who are getting, who are benefiting from the knowledge. That's an incredible point. Thank you for that. Um, so one, you know, uh, just pointing out that you never know what people are receiving whenever you speak uh, to them, whenever you share resources to them, what thing is going to stick. Um, but also just the revelations for yourself are really important to your own growth. And so that's a really beautiful incentive, unintentional incentive for sharing resources and things. And so uh, we've been talking a lot about community. Um, I know that, you know, New Orleans, the industry, the Indian industry in the South in general is a lot smaller. We know people. Um, and I feel like we have a really good sense of community here, but I'm wondering if in your respective experiences, um, if that changes depending on where you are, like how much regionality plays a part, you know, how would you describe the, the filmmaking community in Los Angeles? And, you know, has it changed to other places that you've, you've visited to work or what is, yeah, what does that look like for y'all? I can start with that because I have a very interesting situation yeah. right now. So, I mean, I think there is, there's always been this idea that you must live in LA to make it um, in the industry. And I don't know that that wasn't true at some point, um, but I don't think that it is as true as it once was now. And I don't know if the pandemic affected it, but I do know that I've learned of so many people who are making great work who do not live in Los Angeles. Um, and I think because this is such a global community, because you know you can get on a Zoom or call someone or jump on a plane or whatever you need to do, um, you don't you don't need that um, as much anymore. Like I I don't live right now in Los Angeles. I don't live anywhere really. I'm at my mom's house as you saw my dad in the background, but but like I can be there and like this whole year I traveled you know all types of places that I just wanted to be and worked from those places. So I think. Um, the community, the LA community is small, but mighty, and it's also expansive. So I don't think that it's a, it's, it, it's a rule now. And I think especially for those of us who are people of color, who finances could be a barrier. I think it's really about figuring out a way to hook in and find your people. Um, and I've, I've, I made a pilot in Memphis and I swear those Memphis um, folks that I met there are more connected in LA than I am like they'll be telling me about stuff and I'm like how you know that you know and they're always there so I think and they live in Memphis you know and they've done projects that have come to Memphis and made those connections so I don't know I don't think it is um, as necessary to be in LA I mean LA is where you go to get the money but more and more as a producer even of you know larger movies uh, they're not being filmed in Los Angeles and so there are communities that are everywhere um, and you can really kind of create the experience that you want, in my opinion. Yeah, I agree. Like, I feel like what I'm fighting, I found a filmmaking community in LA, but also I wasn't really looking for a filmmaking community prior to this because um, I was in a different community. So I, I had communities in New York. I had communities in Baltimore and DC. I have found a filmmaking community in LA, but we are not L of LA, if that makes sense. So like, even as a lot of us are rethinking next steps and maybe we're gonna be, you know, in a compound living somewhere else or we're gonna be <laughs> by coastal or we're gonna, the community is still there. Um, Cause I, for me, I think it's like a spirit, it's an intention, it's the humanity aspect of it more so than the location. Um, but I also think that's just because LA is such a sprawling place. I think that regionality and location is definitely like a character and a part interwoven in the community and other spaces. For me in LA, that has not been the case. Um, it's definitely been the people and the spirit of which we want to make our stuff or the spirit in which we want to be of service that has connected me. Um, and I feel like we'll be connected because of that no matter where we are, um, even if we are together physically or not, even if we're collaborating or not, that that spirit will always Will always be there. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Um, what, I guess, what, what advice would you have for emerging filmmakers who are looking to build those communities for themselves, who, you know, are maybe not coming out of film school where so many people are able to meet the DPs that they're going to work with, or the editors, or even some of the producers, 
Um, but who are, you know, just looking to find their folks because it's, it's a collaborative field, it's a collaborative medium, um, and it takes other people. What would you suggest to them? Um, well, I didn't go to film school, um, and I also moved to LA at 35, um, which, you know, it can be harder to, I think, make friends um, as you get older. But I found a couple things helped. One was stepping out of my comfort zone and doing things and going places that I would not normally do or go to um, because it opened me up to meet people. Um, so I was helping with sets. I was um, volunteering. Volunteering is also a great way, I think, to be of service and meet people. But I was just like doing stuff. Um, in COVID times, it might be a, more, a little bit more difficult, but maybe not because that's when, you know, you may start an Instagram live conversation series, you know, to talk with friends. I think for me, it was like, let me start some stuff. I remember starting my first writer's group. It didn't work out, but I found an original one, but it was like taking the initiative to start things that would gather people. Um, actually, I would just Mel, just Mel had an event with her company not long ago. And you were talking about Mel, how you would have Sunday dinners. I think that it doesn't always have to be under the, under the guise of like work. <laughs> it could just be like, let's get together. Like one of the things I do now is gather, want, um, gather friends at the beach once a month, like start just be, being init initiating spaces and opportunities to gather and then also attending when people extend an invitation attending things and opportunities to gather um really work for me and then finding out who your people are because i don't like a lot of people to be honest, i'll be real honest um and so when you find those people genuinely nurturing those relationships showing up being there passing along information listening like the things that's required to to build community in that way I agree with everything Felicia said. I don't have much to add to that. I think for me, it's always been about the people. And I find that mo a lot of my friends, um, my actual friends, I mean, you have like colleagues and people that you make stuff with, but um, my actual friend friends are LA natives that I met as a daycare or at some event that was not film um, related. And some of them ended up being filmmakers and ended up working together, but I met them at a non-film related event. And I think part of what I would suggest is to live and to enjoy your life and to make sure that, I mean, this, you know, this, some people will disagree with this, but for me, making everything about making film was problematic, you know, because I also felt like, how do you talk about experience that you haven't had? and don't even have anything tangentially to compare it to because your whole world's been wrapped into the, you know, the making of something um, instead of the making of your actual life. And so I think I would just tell people to enjoy their life, like have experiences. Like I have so many stories to tell because I live big, you know? So it doesn't, they, you know, like eventually you'll figure out the technicality of making it great. If you keep doing it, it'll start, your voice will start to, you know, become you know more clear and your crew will start to show themselves to you but if you don't have anything to say um and you haven't really poured into yourself then I think it's really hard and so yeah I think just live like when you're doing things you love you meet other people who do things that you love and then you can build from there so I'm glad I'm glad you said that Mel because I felt like when I came out here I would notice how people got wrapped up, like they came out of school and like after school, their whole life has been trying to get on and they've gotten wrapped up into that. And it's hard to unravel yourself um, when you are wrapped up like that because your identity is wrapped up in it, your your life, your circle, everything is wrapped up in that. Um, so I appreciate you saying that because it, you can tell, <laughs> you can definitely yeah. tell. Yeah, and like, I, I know that whatever story I'm telling is not because um, I feel like it might be cool. You know, it's because it's deeply important to me. There's some lesson that I learned or something I experienced that I want to share with the world. It needs to come out. Yeah, and I think that those are the types of stories, you know, like even like really love that deeply resonate with people. Even if like through the making of it, it's not, you know, like however it comes out, like the spirit of it um, resonates. And I think that that you can't ever go wrong when when, when you're expressing from your truth or a universal truth that you deeply understand. And um, so you have to live, you know, in order to do that. You said you didn't want to be a preacher, but that was a word. <laughs> that was a word. <laughs> <From my daddy. laughs> no, <I'm sorry. laughs>
-hmm. Yeah, that's that's a beautiful takeaway is to just um, live a life, live your life and, you know, your experiences. I mean, because that's so much of our creative fuel anyway. Uh, I'm thinking a lot about uh, just some of the things that y'all have said have reminded me how much just community building and finding community uh, has been, and, and, you know, learning to be in relationship to one another has been at the top of so many people's heads in the midst of this pandemic when, you know, we were at the top of it, very disconnected and then trying to integrate back into society um, as it's still going. And so it's interesting to think about that from, you know, a personal perspective. People are exploring that platonically, romantically, professionally, uh, the community always seems to kind of come back to the root of so many conversations we're having about anything. So uh, this is incredible to just hear y'all talk about. So before we uh, before we wrap it, things up, I guess my last question is, it, is there, and maybe you've hit on this as well, and just, you know, um, folks who moved to LA and who are so thirsty, but is there anything else that you would say uh, is lacking in terms of, you know, the film community, uh, whether it's in LA, whether it's just general, like, is there any, how, how, how can we grow, you know, how can we improve being in relationship with one another uh, while we're creating? I think criticism is something that as a, as a, as a Black community, um, maybe even as women too, that I think that we have, we can, it, I think there's some growth that's necessary there. I think um, being able to say about, to a filmmaker, not like about them, like in the streets and you don't even know the person, but being able to like talk to your friend and say, I really enjoyed what you were doing there, but these are some of the things that like I had questions about, you know, and that didn't necessarily, I don't think landed for me, you know? And like, because part of um, getting better is learning from your mistakes. And like, if your intention was to do something and a number of people actually communicated to you that they didn't get that, then you would try it differently the next time. And I think because we live in a world that's so polarized by race and class and sex, um, sometimes we can just rally around anybody who's um, made a film at all. And like, yeah, you know, and I think that we, I think we're getting to a place now that's safe enough for us to be able to criticize one each one another. And like, and this is something that someone, one of my friends said to me, and I was like, you know what, we don't do like I didn't when he said it to me, I was like, I don't ever feel comfortable criticizing you. You know what I mean? Like when I'm thinking about it, you know, and I'm like, dang, you're right. Like we're so because we know how hard it is, there's so many systematic issues. Um, and when you look at a film, you already know if my, if green dollars were a part of it some type of white gaze is on it. You know what I mean? Like, it's just the, the truth. But despite that, we have to challenge ourselves to, to, to make the work that is representative of us. So I think something that I would love to work on myself and that I would want from my peers is, is, is criticism. For you to tell me, eh, this was, you know, this is how I felt about it, truly. So that I would have the opportunity to to build on that for the next thing. Cause I'm going to keep making things. So might as well make them better and better and better. Um, yeah. Which makes me think that, you know, our audience is also a part of our community um, and, and how those conversations are had online, how we share critique, you know, how we don't always feel safe to share critique. How it, I, I think there's just, that's a great point that you bring up. There's a lot of work to do around um, how to engage with, you know, a work of art. It's interesting because we, and Mel and I haven't had a chance to talk about this, but like the release of Really Love has really um, been great in me being able to like neutralize in a, in a, in a way that allowing people to have space to have opinions and critiques and not taking it personally, um, evaluate, evaluating them and, and saying, thinking about taking into the next work, but like holding space essentially for people to vent and critique and criticize. And also like, honestly giving the work to the people, like not just saying that, but honestly, and when you give something to the people, it's like allowing the people to do with, with it what they may. Um, and that has been a really powerful lesson to me because I was very scared. <laughs> I'll be honest, that shit is scary. Um, 
And yeah, it's been like, oh, this is, this is not life or death. This is like, you know, it's actually, first of all, happy that people are talking about it and it's healthy and can learn from this. And so that has been pretty amazing. Um, but what I would say is, I would say self-work. I feel like um, I personally see the connection between my craft and self-work. The more that I work on myself, the more that I get to know myself, the more that I'm able to go deeper with myself, the more that I'm able to go deeper in my work, and the more that I'm able to have deeper relationships with collaborate, collaborators because I have a stronger sense of self. Um, I also have a stronger sense of like uh, ego, boundaries, uh, triggers, all these things. So I just feel like the self-work, like there's just such a strong connection between the two. Um, and I just would love for us to be able to be doing more of that work because it does influence the craft, it influences the practice, and it influences like the creative process and how you relate to collaborators, how you relate to criticism, how you relate to all the things that's part of, of, of making. Um, so that's what I would say I would want for us. Huge part of the toolkit. I feel like so many creative uh, books you read about creative processes and um, you know, inspiration for artists start with self-searching. And I think I shouted this out on another panel that was a completely different topic, but I've been reading uh, How We Show Up by Mia Bird's song, where she speaks a lot about community building. And um, so much of it is, like you said, Felicia, just understanding what your own boundaries are and what it is that you have to give and what it is that you need and establishing those relationships and understanding it might not look the same with, you know, it might look different with different people it's going to. Uh, so this is just, yeah, the, all of this is so valuable, everything that y'all have shared tonight. So thank you so much. Um, any, any final thoughts or shout outs or anything else you wanna share before we close out for the night? Okay, I'll go first. Um, I would share, hmm, hmm, the last thing. Um, Okay, I've been on this, um, talk about books for reading. I'm very much in love with Pleasure Activism by Adrienne Marie Brown. And um, I think that it's super important um, for black women because there's all that's on this call right now. So I'll speak to us first, but I think anything that applies to black women applies to everyone at that point, um, especially when it comes to self care. But like, it's really important for us to um, seek pleasure in our lives and to, and to really um, do our be best to center it, um, uh, to, to make sure that joy is a priority um, and that taking care of ourselves is, I think we make the best work, like you said, Felicia, um, when we center ourselves in our own realities, um, then we can do that in our own stories. And so, yeah, I think for me, it's like knowing that that's the the greatest rebellion, you know, the greatest form of activism is to take care of ourselves, but but one step further, you know, to actually seek pleasure and allow that um, for our lives. So that's what I'll say. That's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. And Felicia, any final words? I just want to thank the the New New Orleans Film Society and you know the film festival I attended the, for the first time a couple of years ago, it was one of the most amazing film festivals I've been to because it did feel, I felt that community. I felt very centered as a black woman artist. Um, and I also felt like others who are even more marginalized were centered, which was amazing. And I had you know the opportunity to be in conversation with community um, uh, on a panel. So I just, I, I just, want to say I know it's a lot of work <laughs> it looks effortless but like I appreciate the everyone that's putting the work together to um, make the festival happen and programming year round and and bringing us together is just pretty amazing so um yeah that's all I would say we so appreciate that and we appreciate both of you for joining thank you Felicia thank you Mel thank, thank you for everyone tuning in too um, and yeah, I hope you continue to enjoy the rest of the festival. Please go watch as many films as you can while they're available. Find out who your next favorite artist is. And we'll see you next year. Thanks. <laughs>